Thank you everyone for joining with us for yet another interesting webinar on interventional radiology and image guided procedure by Dr. Lina Dalal, madam. As we all know, interventional radiography techniques in veterinary practice offers a number of advantages to more traditional therapies. These procedures are minimally invasive and can therefore lead to reduced perioperative morbidity and mortality, shorter anesthesia times and shorter hospital stay. Despite applications in veterinary medicine, interventional radiology techniques have not been widely adopted. However, today's webinar aims to provide a basic understanding of interventional radiography techniques and image-guided procedures in veterinary practice by Dr. Lina Dalal, madam. Dr. Lina Dalal graduated from Mumbai Veterinary College in 1984 and received her master's degree in veterinary surgery and radiology from the same institute in 1987. After a 15-year status to raise a family, during which she kept her skills at surgery active while working as honorary trustee and surgeon to an animal welfare organization, AIAWA. She established a private clinic in 2001 at Churchgate in Mumbai. The vision of a multi-speciality chain focusing on small animals was achieved over the last few years with the establishment of Mahalakshmi, Goa and Powai Center. Dr. Lina is a dedicated and focused vet who keeps upgrading her knowledge and skills with the latest in the veterinary field by attending national and international certifications and courses in various disciplines every year. Her interest in orthopedics and physical rehabilitation has led to a combination with many successes at both the Mahalakshmi and Goa Center, which both have surgical and physiotherapy and hydrotherapy units dedicated to lameness. She has, in the last few years, started working with minimally access surgery and image-guided interventions. She is an active member of Veterinary Interventional Radiology and International Endoscopy Society, VIRIES, and of the International Veterinary Orthopedic Community, AOVAT. In view of her expertise and keen interest in Veterinary Interventional Radiology and image-guided procedures, I would request Dr. Lina Dalal, madam, to deliver today's webinar. Over to madam, please. Ma'am, please unmute your mic. Thank you, Dr. Kumari, for that introduction. And thank you, INTAS and ISBS, for this wonderful opportunity. Um, can I present my screen now? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am. Can you see my screen? Is it uh, not visible? yet? Not yet. Will you let me know when it is? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Can you unshare and just try sharing again? Sure. Yeah, ma'am, it's coming up. Yeah. Is it up? Can you yeah, see yeah. the screen? Yeah, we can. We can. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. As introduced, I am Dr. Lina Dalal. I own and practice from the Petzone group of clinics, which are based in Mumbai and Goa. Petzone clinics are a part of Annie Hill Hospitals, along with Max Vets in Delhi and the Animal Care Center in Hyderabad. And we work collaboratively across all our centers in India. So the thumbs of procedures I will be talking about today have been done at one or the other of our centers. My topic for today is veterinary interventional radiology, which is an emerging discipline worldwide, but to the best of my knowledge, it is still nascent in India. My personal foray into interventional procedures began with the installation of a C-arm at my practice in Mumbai in 2019. 
and a chance meeting with Dr. Marilyn Dunn from the University of Montreal, who is an authority in the field. The installation of the CRM, which was originally meant for my orthopedic work, allowed us to start doing some IR procedures. And what you see in the slide is our surgical suite at our Mahalakshmi Center in Mumbai. This is my surgical team at my Mumbai Center. And we are all very excited to be able to explore and implement interventional procedures into the practice. Unfortunately, the COVID crisis and Mumbai lockdowns and the travel issues and the ensuing difficulty with imports of devices have set back our timeline, but we are committed to moving ahead as soon as the situation gets better. Now, my intent with this talk is not really to describe techniques because they are only of significance if you have the equipment and the setup for IR, but I'd really like to put a window to the world of interventions that can be done and that are being done elsewhere and may be done by us in the future. So what is interventional radiology? It is image guided surgery, or if you want to call it that, it is surgical radiology. With IR, procedures that are minimally invasive are performed under image guidance. It started as a subset of mainstream radiology, but it is now recognized as a specialty by itself. And interventional procedures have been around in human medicine for much longer than in veterinary medicine, where they are relatively new. But I'm sure that with the passage of time and reduction in costs, these procedures will become much more common even with us. The main imaging modalities that we use to guide interventions are fluoroscopy, ultrasound, CT and MR. While guidance can be achieved with all these modalities, the term interventional radiology significantly refers to the use of fluoroscopy based equipment. And when deciding between all these modalities, the interventional radiologist must balance the type of procedure, the individual patient's characteristics and the advantages and disadvantages of each modality. Fluoroscopy has the benefit of being real time it is portable. It has the ability to save images, which you can review later. And it is an indispensable tool for guide wire and catheter manipulation. It has some negatives though, and a big one is radiation exposure and also the inability to clearly visualize uh, visceral organs. It, uh, a fluoroscope with digital subtraction capabilities is necessary if you want to do cardiovascular work. Ultrasound has the advantage of real-time guidance and manipulation. There is no radiation exposure and of course the cost is much lower. It is used primarily for vascular access, biopsies and drainage procedures. One of the negatives of ultrasound is that it is totally dependent on the operator and on the operator's experience and skill. CT and MR are, uh, cannot provide real-time images, and it is extremely difficult to access the patient during these uh, procedures. But MR does provide soft tissue contrast that is simply unobtainable with X-ray imaging, and is a good tool for solid tissue biopsies, amongst other things. Now, endoscopy, which I have put on this list, is not strictly an imaging modality, since it is used for much more than just uh, imaging but it is an integral part of many image guided procedures, so I have put it on this list. Other equipment that is needed for interventional radiology or IR, and I'm going to be calling it IR henceforth because interventional radiology is a mouthful. Um, other equipment we need for IR is a good electropotary unit and either a Holyag, which is holmium, yttrium, aluminum and garnet, or a diode laser. Laser energy is able to ablate, coagulate and vaporize tissues. And because its thin optical fibers are so transmissible, it makes it an ideal tool for use in percutaneous per procedures. Interventional radiology uses a complete arsenal of devices. 
and maintenance of a stock of these devices is a terribly capital intensive proposition. Basic endovascular equipment includes guide wires and catheters, but a whole slew of other endovascular devices may be needed to be utilized during any given procedure. Guide wires may differ in length, in diameter, in stiffness, in coating. There are multiple types of guide wires, starter wires, selective wires, exchange wires. Catheters come in many shapes and sizes, and they are used with guide wires to advance through vessels and potentially to, to cross lesions. Balloons, stents, thrombectomy devices, they can be used to open up narrowed or blocked blood vessels. Biopsy devices can be used to take samples of potential tumors. Embolic materials like foils, plugs and beads can be used to block blood flow to bleeding lesions. Some beads can be mixed with radioactive material or chemotherapy drugs to treat cancer. Or we can use special needles to burn or freeze cancers as well. Now, these type of devices and all the devices that are available in new product design continues to grow at a very rapid rate. And there is huge place for productivity. And you may just find that something you bought today is you're not going to use tomorrow because something new has come about. Now, setting up an IR suite appropriately requires meticulous organization. Uh, when setting up for an IR procedure, it is important that the operator has all the equipment that is necessary and that the procedure has been well thought out, that the room is appropriately organized so that the equipment needed for the procedure is properly positioned. A C-arm takes a lot of room to move. It's heavy and it's large and it needs to be correctly positioned for the procedure so that you get the views that you need in the orientation that you need and you need to keep that in mind. And one of the things that I discovered very quickly was that no matter how much space you have, you always need more. If you look at this hybrid surgery suite and you look at the amount of things in there, you realize what I mean. In a city like Mumbai, you can imagine how that hurts. Easy viewing of both your fluoroscopy and endoscopy simultaneously on monitors is very important. And if possible, you need two monitors for endoscopy and that will give you better visibility. The operator should keep make sure that he or she has more than one wire, catheter, needle, balloon, laser fiber, basket, whatever is being used available in the event that one breaks or gets contaminated or becomes difficult to use over time. Wires and baskets typically uh, get damaged over time. So make sure that that is always available, otherwise you end up in a mess. Ideally, your uh, OR, your uh, IR room should be a hybrid room. It should also be a sterile operating room so that if surgical conversion is necessary, this is easily performed. Now, how do IR procedures benefit our patients? And this is an important question because of the cost of IR procedures, it, it, the only way they'll be done is if they really benefit your, if it really benefits the patient. They are minimally invasive. They can result in less mortality, less morbidity. They reduce anesthesia times. They reduce hospital stays and therefore with uh, less equipment intensive procedures, some procedures can be cheaper because hospital stays are reduced. Also, IR addresses many clinical conditions in animals that cannot be treated by standard surgical or medical therapy. For example, tumors that are non-resectable, which can be chemoembolized and malignant obstructions, which can be stented to provide relief. The primary disadvantages of IR are that it requires a lot of technical expertise and specialized equipment is necessary and it involves a very large capital investment, not only for the equipment, but also to provide a suitable inventory of catheters, guide wires, balloons, stents, foils and other devices. Now, what are the kind of procedures that, we, that can be done? 
interventional procedures are used in almost everybody's system. In the rest of this presentation, I will go through the kind of procedures that are done in the veterinary sphere and describe a couple in more detail. It's not an exhaustive list by any means, but my rationale for this is to give the participants who are not familiar with IR a perspective of the possibilities. So like I said earlier, I will concentrate on indications and complications rather than technique. So let us start with the cardiovascular and the lymphatic systems. Lymphangiography can be performed by direct injection of uh, an aqueous contrast medium into a lymphatic vessel or a lymph node to outline the uh, lymphatic system. Percutaneous injection into the popliteal lymph node and fluoroscopic imaging can provide detailed anatomy of the cisterna chile and the thoracic duct, which you will, which you will need for thoracic duct ligation in cases of chylothorax. Uh, this can also guide the selection of a surgical technique. And post your surgery, post procedural lymphangiography can determine whether complete occlusion of the duct has occurred or not. If it reveals a persistent flow in the thoracic duct, like this, these little squiggly lines that you see below the duct, uh, that indicates that a complete ductal occlusion has not happened and the surgeon needs to check why and re-perform the ductal occlusion. Um, in cases of idiopathic chylothorax, Conservative management consists of intermittent pleural drainage and a low-fat diet, but this doesn't resolve the condition in most, ca most cases and it tends to recur. Uh, surgical options are thoracic duct ligation, pericardectomy, cisterna chile ablation, and these uh, procedures are the most performed ones for the management of idiopathic, idiopathic chylothorax, but they usually require a thoracotomy and some surgeons do a laparotomy as well. Uh, thoracos thoracoscopic or minimal access alternatives to open surgery can also be performed. But an interventional approach to this condition is to glue embolize the cisterna chile and the thoracic duct via injecting the mesenteric uh, lymph node at the time of laparotomy. Now, uh, cyanoacrylate was the glue used at one time but a non-adhesive liquid embolic agent called Onyx has been developed, which is far more suitable. Advantages of an interventional approach to this uh, compared to a traditional open surgical technique are shorter anesthesia and surgery times, uh, the technical ease of the procedure, and that it is a single cavitary approach. If uh, a pericardectomy needs to be done, it can be done through the diaphragm it, with a diaphragmatic approach with, uh, uh, with minimal access surgery. Also, glue embolization allows for the ability to occlude the smaller tributary branches of the thoracic duct that cannot be easily visualized otherwise and which may be contributing factors to a recurrent chylothorax. And an indwelling thoracic port, which you can see in this radiograph, can also be placed subcutaneously attached to a catheter for long-term drainage. Uh, these ports are also inserted for other conditions like recurrent pleural effusions for convenient drainage of the effusion. IR can also be used for thrombectomy and thrombolysis. Due to the difficulty of identifying thrombosis in veterinary medicine, many patients with thrombosis go undiagnosed. Whether it is a saddle thrombus or a left atrial thrombus or portal vein thrombosis, a lot of these patients are not treated due to confusion regarding their medical management. Now, these procedures are cutting edge and they require a lot of expertise in correctly guiding catheters. This slide shows serial angiograms from a report by doctors Dunn and Weiss of a dog that is receiving catheter-directed thrombolysis and vascular stenting for an aortic saddle thrombus. 
This is the initial uh, DSA aortogram. There is a pigtail marker catheter in uh, that was passed through the carotid artery and you can see complete attenuation of the aorta. The black arrow points to it. There is no blood flow beyond that point or there is very little blood flow beyond that point. Um, this is the DSA arteriogram showing a patent right external iliac artery and a faintly patent left internal iliac artery with a clot present at the aortic trifurcation, which is outlined by the dotted line. These are close ups of the right external iliac artery and the left internal iliac artery, which show that there is you can see the little uh, blush over here that shows that there is some muscle perfusion. So these two arteries are not completely thrombosed. The procedure that was done was that stents were placed bilaterally in the external iliac arteries. Uh, this image shows the stents prior to deployment. This image shows the uh, shows the blood flow immediately following deployment. And this is a DSA aortogram via a pigtail catheter, which is which I think you can see which is demarcated by the white arrows. And it shows the reestablished blood flow through both the external iliac arteries. Currently, DSA or digital subtraction angiography has become an indispensable tool in angiography and in endovascular interventions. It is a digital technique available in some fluoroscopes that substantially improves the contrast resolution of angiography. Uh, IR also helps with cardiac pacemaker implantation. Pacemaker therapy is the treatment of choice for certain bradyarrhythmias such as complete AV block, sick sinus syndrome, sinus road dysfunction, or persistent atrial standstill. Uh, Cushy was a seven-year-old cocker spaniel with a complete heart block into whom we implanted a pacemaker at our Delhi center. In this slide, in this uh, radiograph, you can see the a uh, pacemaker that has been implanted subcutaneously and the lead wire that is going into the right ventricle. This was done under fluoroscopic guidance. The pacemaker lead was inserted through the jugular and it was threaded into the right ventricle under fluoroscopic guidance and the pulse generator unit was then sutured into the subcutaneous space in the neck. Pre and post pacemaker echoes. This is the pre post maker echo. And the post pacemaker echo. They show the obvious difference that the pacemaker has made. Um, the other procedures that can be done are hemorrhages that are not stoppable by other means, like for example, some nosebleeds, uh, especially those that come from tumors, they can be embolized. Pericardial effusions can be tapped. Balloon pericardiotomy can be performed under fluoroscopic guidance. Cardiac tumors are palliated by stenting and ballooning of cardiac valves can be performed. PDA is treated with uh, persistent ductus uh, arteriosus, is treated with a coil that is specially designed for this called an Amplatzer occluder. In fact, a special canine PDA occluder has also been developed. For the urogenital system, there are many interventional procedures that are done. Excretory urography under either fluoroscopic or CT imaging. Percutaneous anti-grade pyelography under fluoroscopic view can be done. Of course, retrograde contrast imaging can also be done for the urethra and the bladder. 
for bladder calculi, laser lithotripsy can be done. It is a minimally invasive technique that fragments uroliths using a Holyag laser until the stone fragments are smaller than the urethra. You can see the fragments being pitted and uh, fragmented in these slides. Sorry, you can see them in these slides. The fragments are then removed by a combination of a uh, cystoscopic guided stone basket retrieval. You can see it happening here and avoiding, avoiding uh, urohydropropulsion, which I think most people are familiar with. This technique is best suited to female dogs and cats with bladder or urethral urolith and male dogs with relatively fewer uroliths. It is not a good procedure for animals with larger stone burdens. Equipment that is needed are various uh, cystoscopes and a Holyag laser with the appropriate fibers. In male dogs and female cats, stones of up to 5 mm can be addressed. In female dogs, you can go up to 10 mm stones. In male cats, of course, you do not perform this procedure. Uh, limitations of this procedure is that the animal must be able to accept the cystoscope and in, there should be no more than two to four cystoliths that require fragmentation in female dogs. The rest can be removed by stone basket retrieval. No more than two cystoliths that require fragmentation in male dogs and female cats. Complications with this procedure are the risk of bladder rupture or perforation. So you need to be ready to convert to a cystotomy. And since it is not possible to lavage the abdomen with these procedures, all patients should have a negative urine culture prior to any procedure. And if the culture is positive, then antibiotic therapy needs to be instituted for a few days before the procedure. Another procedure that can be done for a transitional cell carcinoma is ultrasound guided endoscopic diode laser ablation. That's quite a mouthful, but it's a palliative procedure used to maintain the flow of urine through the lower urinary tract, which is full of tumor. By decreasing the tumor burden or the size of the tumor associated with a transitional cell carcinoma. And by this maintaining the patency of the flow of urine. The essential equipment for this procedure consists of a diode laser, an ultrasound machine and an endoscope. It is necessary that you advise the owners that this procedure is not a cure, that the tumor will grow back and that there is potential for numerous complications and also that chemotherapy is an important component of the overall treatment plan. And they also need to know that these tumors may require numerous procedures for maximal effect, which is then obviously associated with greater expense and greater risk. The most uh, immediate and significant risk with this procedure is perforation of the urinary tract and leakage of urine into the abdominal cavity. Uh, the more experience the person doing the ablation has, the likelihood of complications obviously, especially a perforation decrease. Urethral obstructions can result in extreme discomfort and life-threatening biochemical change. Urethral stenting can offer a rapid, safe, and an effective means of re-establishing patency of the urethra and this can be done in an outpatient setting. It is most commonly done for obstructions that are secondary to malignancy, but it can also be done for strictures and external compression of the urethra by masses like, uh, I'm sorry, masses like uh, the masses in the anal gland or prostatic masses. Laser cut, self-expanding uh, self stents are generally used for this. In these uh, fluoroscopic images, you can see the contrast is not seen in the urethra where the mass is pressing on the urethra. And after stenting, there is complete 
filling of contrast throughout the urethra. This is the stent, what the stent looks like within the urethra. This procedure is best performed under fluoroscopy. And these stents appear to cause very little discomfort. I presume this is because tumors do not contain nerve endings and it is possible that patients have very little awareness of the stent. There can be tumor in growth through the stent and dogs can also develop a urethral obstruction beyond the ends of the stent from the progression of the tumor. Uh, repeat stenting to relieve the new obstruction can also be done. A major complication here is urinary incontinence, so you must prepare the client for this. We are all familiar with uh, spayed female dogs who develop urinary incontinence. It is the most common type of urinary incontinence recognized in female dogs due to urethral sphincter mechanism incompetence. And the relatively high prevalence of this condition in female dogs and the overall intolerance by pet owners has led to the use of urethral bulking agents, which is actually adapted from human urology. Um, although many materials have been investigated, the theory behind all these injectable bulking agents is to, in, is to increase the stretch in the sphincter muscles, uh, leading to an increased resting closure, uh, sorry, to a, leading to an increased resting closure pressure in the urethra. In addition, the implant narrows the diameter of the urethral lumen allowing the urethral sphincter to close more effectively. This schematic shows the bladder before collagen injection and the bladder after collagen injection. You can see the narrowing of the urethra and the closing up of the uh, urethral sphincter. The material is injected submucosally into the proximal urethra via cystoscopy. And uh, the agents that are used for this today are primarily something called PDMS, polydimethylsiloxane. Uh, the brand name is Macroplastic. And if it is available, bovine cross-linked uh, collagen may also be used. Another condition that is well treated with IR are blocked ureters. When ureters are blocked, whether they are blocked by lits, by strictures or by neoplasia, renal function deteriorates very rapidly. So something needs to be done as quickly as possible. A subcutaneous ureteral bypass system or subs can be implanted with uh, fluoroscopic guidance. And this technique is particularly useful in cats where, it, where there is a very low complication rate. Um, what does it involve? It involves a connecting tube between the kidney of the affected side and, and the bladder. And both are connected to a shunting port, which is placed along the ventral abdominal wall. And this port can be used for sampling the urine when necessary. Uh, you, you might be wondering why the, uh, the cranial catheter is directed caudally and the caudal catheter cranially. That is to prevent migration uh, and hold the catheters in place. Ureter, uh, ureteral stents also have their place for blocked ureters particularly in larger patients where these can be placed in a retrograde manner uh, through the use of cystoscopy and fluoroscopy to bypass the obstruction and thereby avoid surgery. Other urogenital system techniques are sclerotherapy, which is a renal sparing chemical cauterization technique used in cases of uh, idiopathic renal hematuria. Ectopic ureters can be addressed with IR by cystoscopic guided laser ablation and laser ablation can also be used with bladder polyps. Cystostomy tubes can be placed percutaneously under fluoroscopic guidance to provide temporary or permanent urinary bypass 
for patients who have obstructive or neurologic disease where a urethral catheter is not possible or not desirable. Complications with this technique include infection, uh, premature dislodgement, uroabdomen, obstruction of the tube, and sometimes fistula formation uh, following removal of the tube. For the GI and the hepatobiliary systems, there are again a number of a number of IR procedures that are done. One of them is for esophageal stricture. Uh, oh, I think I spelled esophageal wrong there. Anyway, uh, the most common cause of uh, uh, esophageal stricture is esophagitis, which results from chemicals thermal, traumatic, and infectious agents from persistent vomiting, from esophageal foreign bodies, and sometimes also from the gastroesophageal reflux that occurs during anesthesia. Uh, you can see the stricture in this image. And in the next image, you see uh, balloon dilation, which involves passing an inflatable balloon into the picture under endoscopic or fluoroscopic guidance. The balloon is expanded with saline or a dilute contrast agent if you're using fluoroscopy to a preset diameter and pressure to gradually stretch the stric uh, stricture to a larger opening. Uh, repeat ballooning is very often necessary, so you need to warn your client of that. Potential complications of balloon dilation include bleeding, uh, tearing of the esophagus, uh, esophageal diverticulum, infection, aspiration, and well, I guess that's it. Uh, stenting for GI obstructions. GI obstructions occur secondary to strictures or tumors and they occur most commonly in the descending colon or in the proximal duodenum of the pylorus. When it is an inoperable lesion, stenting can be considered, especially in those animals where obstruction has resulted in vomiting and malnutrition. GI stents are typically metallic and of a self-expanding nature. They are either uncovered, partially covered or fully covered. And the advantage of a covered stent is a lower rate of uh, reobstruction, especially with strictures, but they also have a higher rate of migration due to the failure of tissue and growth since they are covered. Some of the uh, currently available colonic stents have a dumbbell shape uh, at either one or both ends. Uh, this, is, this is to prevent migration. Uh, covered stents, since they are intended for short time use, also have a string around each end so that they can be easily removed endoscopically with a grasping instrument. I think we are all familiar with gastric foreign body retrieval, but this is a bit of a tweak on the conventional endoscopic retrieval of a foreign body. This two-year-old GSD Imli was a referral patient who had swallowed a screw and who came to us after two successive endoscopies failed to retrieve the, the screw due to the amount of ingesta in the stomach. The client did not want to consider open surgery at all. Uh, we were also unable to see the screw inside all the con stomach content. So the fluoroscope was put into action uh, you can see the endoscope being uh, shown on the fluoroscopic image. And the screw was successfully retrieved. The addition of fluoroscopy to endoscopy can allow location and retrieval. And by doing this, we achieved an intervention by using imaging technology and no open or laparoscopic surgery was then required. This is another case of a gastric foreign body retrieval which lodged in the cardia. Uh, this three-year-old Frenchie had swallowed a rather large ear pod and on endoscopic retrieval, it would not budge through the cardia due to its shape and size. 
uh, under fluoroscopic guidance. It was snared, it was rotated, and it was gradually extracted. Uh, IR procedures are also good for, for feeding tube placements. Uh, this case actually took place two days ago. Um, this is a nasogeginal feed tube placement. Molly was a, is a 12-year-old female dog with intractable vomiting due to recurrence of uh, acute pancreatitis. A nasogeginal tube, which you see in this picture, was used to bypass feeding into the stomach and duodenum, and it was inserted endoscopically through the pylorus and advanced into the jejunum under fluoroscopic guidance. The, prior to the procedure, uh, a dye was fed to the dog. Uh, uh, a, um, a dye was fed in order to outline the uh, the, you can't see the organs on the fluoroscope because uh, the fluoroscope does not uh, give you good vision of the visceral organs. So we gave the dog a dye to outline the, uh, intest uh, outline the intestines. Molly is doing well today. I'm sorry, I need to go back. Okay, uh, other conditions that can be treated are like um, gastrointestinal polyps. Uh, they're rare, but gastric and colonic polyps can be resected endoscopically. Complications include perforation, hemorrhage, and recurrence, especially with failure to remove the entire lesion. Multiple types of feeding tubes, as we've seen, can be placed either percutaneously or nasogastrically. There are a lot of hepatobiliary conditions that can potentially be addressed with uh, IR, but these require a high degree of technical skills to both identify and treat. For the hepatobiliary system, CG angiography has evolved as an excellent means of locating portosystemic shunts and hepatic arteriovenous malformations. Uh, recently, Endovascular management of portosystemic shunts has been described by Dr. Weiss at the Animal Medical Center. Interventional techniques such as intra-arterial delivery of chemotherapy and trans-arterial chemoembolization have been developed in order to increase local chemotherapy concentrations and reduce uh, systemic toxicity from chemotherapy to reduce tumor blood supply and oxygenation and improve local uh, tumor control rates in those cancers that have not responded well to systemic chemotherapy. Uh, ERCP or endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography is a minimally invasive technique that combines endoscopy and fluoroscopy to image the biliary system and the pancreatic ducts. This imaging can detect irregularities of filling defects in the biliary and pancreatic ducts. Uh, it can localize and facilitate the removal of gallstones, identify and access neoplastic lesions for biopsy. It can uh, allow you to collect bile for culture and diagnose and relieve bile and pancreatic duct obstru obstructions with stenting. Um, Procedures for the respiratory system, nasal hemorrhage that is re refractory to conservative treatment can be a life-threatening condition. Uh, we've all had cases of epistaxis which just don't stop bleeding. Surgical options for this condition have been limited to ligation of the carotid artery that is performed to reduce the pressure behind the hemorrhage and to allow clotting to occur. However, collateral circulation develops, and if the bleed recurs, carotid artery ligation will not be effective. So in most cases, a primary cause of epistaxis, whether it is a tumor or coagulopathy, will often persist uh, even after carotid artery ligation or uh, the IR procedure, which is embolization. And though both procedures may treat epistaxis acutely, 
only embolization will be effective in the future if the underlying condition does not resolve and hemorrhage recurs. But a note of caution here is that such procedures should only be attempted by people with experience in embolization procedures and in super selective catheterizations, because if a, a non target embolization happens, uh, severe complications and uh, tissue necrosis can be the result. Um, thoracic drainage catheters are used for temporary pleural air or fluid drainage by inserting pigtail catheters with or without guide wires. And this can be done under ultrasound guidance. As discussed earlier, permanent pleural drainage can be accomplished by the placement of an intrathoracic drain that is attached to a subcutaneous port. By far the most common uh, respiratory, uh, respiratory condition that is treated by IR is uh, the treatment of um, tracheal collapse by intraluminal tracheal stenting. And this provides a minimally invasive non-surgical method of treatment for of a narrow or obstructed trachea. As of now, it is still primarily a palliative procedure. And the video you are viewing is of a stent that is placed at our center prior to uh, recommending tracheal stenting. It is very important to understand its indications, its limitations and its complications. It is very important that you educate clients to manage their expectations and ensure that regularly scheduled follow up appointments are kept. Uh, that is the only way you can ensure a successful outcome and management of the condition. What are the indications for stenting the trachea? Tracheal stenting can be used for the treatment of tracheal strictures as you can see on this uh, radiograph, these strictures can sometimes even be caused iatrogenically by overinflation of an ET tube cuff. Another indication is the presence of an obstructive tracheal tumor. Again, the introduction of a stent in this case is palliative, but it improves breathing and the quality of life for this animal. Tracheal collapse is the most common indication for tracheal stenting. It commonly affects middle-aged to geriatric small and toy breed dogs. It can affect the cervical or the thoracic trachea or both. And it is caused by weakening of the tracheal cartilage that leads to dorsoventral flattening of the trachea. A majority of dogs with tracheal collapse will respond well to medical management with a combination of antitussives, anti-inflammatories and bronchodilators. But in some cases, after a while, there is, there, there is no response to medication. And that, then these dogs have a life-threatening upper airway obstruction secondary to tracheal collapse, and they become candidates for stenting. Uh, tracheal stenting is most commonly indicated in end stage grade 3 or grade 4 tracheal collapse. Grade, uh, this is the normal canine trachea. In a grade 1 tracheal collapse, 25% of the trachea uh, tracheal diameter is lost. Uh, in, fifth, in grade 2, 50% of the tracheal diameter is lost. Grade 3, 75%. And grade 4, 90% of the tracheal diameter is lost, as you can see in this endoscopic image. So when these dogs come in with a collapsed trachea, they typically sound like this. And this can be visualized on fluoroscopy. also be seen on endoscopy. You can see the collapsing trachea in this uh, video. It narrows to almost a 75% collapse. 
as you can see here. Those dogs who have this honking and raspy breathing respond best to tracheal stenting. Uh, while those dogs with coughing as their primary sign, response is more difficult to predict. Dogs with main stem bronchial collapse are likely to have persistent coughing after, even after tracheal stenting, but the tracheal stenting still improves the airflow and it reduces dyspnea. Current iterations of veterinary tracheal stents are made of self-expanding nitinol mesh, and a combination of tracheobronchoscopy and fluoroscopy is used to identify the location of the tracheal collapse and to measure the size of the trachea. Tracheal stents are typically oversized by two to three millimeters compared to the size of the expanded trachea in order to minimize future shortening and migration. This uh, is a really nice video of um, of the uh, tracheal stent being put in. And this is from the Animal Medical Center and it is such a nice video that I thought to reproduce it here. The patient is placed in lateral recumbency with the neck flexed in order to extend the, to straighten the trachea as much as possible. And a marker catheter is, which you can see here, is advanced, this one, is advanced through the esophagus until the markers span the entire length of the trachea. In the fluoroscopic image, the cricoid and the carina uh, should both be identified in the field of view. The uh, stent delivery system is advanced down the trachea. You can see it being advanced. And the sheath is gently withdrawn as the stent is slowly advanced into the trachea using the marker catheter as a guide to see that it is deployed to span the narrowed part of the trachea. A gentle push and pull of the delivery system confirms that the partially deployed stent is not sitting back and forth. If the stent is moving within the trachea, it is undersized and it should be reconstrained like this and removed before complete deployment and a larger size should be chosen. What are the complications of tracheal stenting? The biggest risk of tracheal stenting is anesthesia itself. Good communication is a necessity between the anesthetist and the person inserting the stent. Uh, all emergency medicine should be calculated and should be kept readily available. Long-term complications, uh, which the client should be made aware of, are that there can be continued collapse beyond the stent. Uh, stent shortening can happen. This actually happens in many cases, but it doesn't produce any significant clinical issues. Uh, stent migration can happen, but this again typically happens only when the stent is undersized. There can be infection that causes tracheitis and pneumonia. And if uh, uh, if there is acute worsening of clinical signs after stenting, infection should be considered. Uh, inflammatory and or granulation tissue may um, develop and like you can see here and it can re-block the stent. Stent fracture happens in many cases, but this can typically be stabilized by the placement of a second tracheal stent within the lumen of the first tracheal stent. There can also be bronchial collapse beyond the stent. So those are the complications of tracheal stenting. 
before we before I uh, end this presentation, I would like to discuss the interventions in oncology. Intervention oncology involves the use of all many of the techniques that we have just uh, discussed to treat cancer patients because they would otherwise have no good options. Veterinary cancer patients are typically diagnosed at later stages of the disease and uh, interventional oncology is likely to play an increasingly important role in the management of veterinary cancer patients in the future. Percutaneous tumor ablation, chemoembolization of tumors as we have discussed, palliative stenting of malignant obstructions in blood vessels in the GI, the respiratory and the urinary tracts, thrombolysis through catheters of arterial and venous thrombi created by the tumors, port placement in the thorax or the abdomen for drainage of effusions and for administration of chemotherapy, uh, vascular access ports for repeated administration of chemotherapy or frequent anesthesia for radiation therapy placement and placement of feeding tubes. These are all the indications for interventional oncology. I hope I have given you a good idea of what IR involves and its applications, and I hope that we will be able to use it more in the future. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for taking us into a journey of what you do, actually, and what is possible. A number of things we see is which is not being done currently in even institutions is being done at your area. So congrats for doing all that great work. I was myself aware that CAM is only available in universities. And for me, it's also a surprise that you own a CAM and it is there practically there with you and you are using it fully. So congrats to you and to all your veterinary team. Uh, Ma'am, let me be very frank in saying that uh, a few people have not been able to join in because of a few errors that have happened during the session. And when we were trying to correct them, it said the system, the webinar has already started. So uh, not that uh, it's a system fault, so we did not interrupt it. Uh, but uh, that is uh, how 10% people have not been able to participate, but we'll ensure that they get the live version and they get an access to the system surely. Uh, Ma'am, uh, in terms of questions, the first question is once you have so many interventional radiographies, so how do you look at uh, uh, how, how many number of teams of people that are engaged in this and do you engage with radiologists and all or all everything is done by weights? Uh, I didn't understand that completely, but uh, I, at least I didn't understand that how many teams are there. We have one team uh, at, in the Mumbai center, but because we work pan India, we also work with uh, our clinics in Delhi and Hyderabad. When uh, there is a case that you see these cases don't come about very frequently. Uh, not only are they expensive and uh, are prohibitively expensive for people, uh, sometimes when these cases do come about, we take the opportunity to travel to our other clinic so that we get exposure to those procedures as well. Um, so I guess you can say we have more than one team, but typically uh, you need two or three people uh, in the procedure and they don't all have to be vets. Uh, if you have well-trained para vets, um, they can also help because a lot of this is just handing things um, and being around to move equipment, to rotate the sea arm, to uh, hand you things that you need to inject. You need just maybe one or two people who are uh, aware of what is needed to be done. But an important factor here is that Everybody in the room needs to wear, uh, needs to be protected for um, the radiographic exposure and you need that many lead aprons and thyroid shields and 
whatever else you need. So uh, the list of things you need just keeps going up and up and up. True, ma'am. Uh, the next question is then, ma'am, what uh, what all can CRM do which you earlier thought was not possible as a private practitioner, as a practitioner down there in Mumbai? Well, I actually originally bought the CRM for my orthopedic work just to make it. Uh, uh, I do a lot of orthopedics and it just make things a lot simpler. So that was the original purpose, but because I, uh, you know, orthopedic CRMs typically are cheaper and uh, but because I myself am a cancer survivor, I wanted a CRM that had uh, that had no scatter radiation or had almost zero scatter radiation. So I bought a more expensive one and ended up with one that had digital subtraction and geography capability. And then uh, I met Dr. Marilyn Dunn in the same year that I bought the uh, bought the CRM and um, attending one of her lectures and speaking with her, I realized that there was a world out there that of procedures that we could do now that we had the capability for it. So. Uh, now, the next thing that I would like to do as and when uh, it is possible to do is to buy a laser and try out some of those procedures that we just described. Does that answer the question? Yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Sure. Uh, the next question and the last question is, ma'am, what would be your guidance to the new coming of vets? Because we see that Mumbai has got uh, many things which are not there in the whole country as far as a private practitioner is concerned. So what would be your a few tips for the forthcoming veterinary community? I think so. Uh, the forthcoming veterinary community is particularly um, lucky because they have access to a lot of things that uh, certainly I never had as a student and didn't have as a practitioner starting out even 20 years ago. Things have just moved at such a rapid rate that I would suggest that they start working with people who are uh, doing something that they're interested in because the future is definitely in specialization. Yeah, ma'am. Ma'am, we once again on behalf of the Society, Indian Society of Veterinary Surgery and INTAS, thank you for coming over to that platform, setting an example for many others which will follow in the span in days ahead. We thank you on behalf of the Society, the President and the Executive Secretary for being a part of our group and coming over and expressing out on intervention, radiology and imaging guided procedures. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all.